This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Before I came here, I, I told an Israeli friend of mine that I was coming to the States to give some talks. And he said to me, whom are you talking to? And I said, well, it's a different groups. So I've got three or four groups I'm talking to. Some are undergraduates and a couple of Jewish groups. And he said, well, you tell those undergraduates that Israel is not a racist, fascist, apartheid state. And you tell the Jews that it is. <laughs> and then I the next day happened to be walking down the street and ran into a Palestinian colleague and I told him this story and he said, isn't that the kind of prop, the sort of thing that got Yasser Arafat into trouble, telling one thing to one group and one thing to another group? So I said, you're right, I won't tell different things to different groups, I, but, I, but I thought that my friend's um, comment was worth repeating to you because it, it, he kind of meant it and uh, I think it, it's important to know that uh, the, the, the truths and the falsehoods in this conflict are all relative. There are almost no absolute truths on either side or absolute falsehoods. And one of the things I feel in my job because this conflict has been going on for so long and it has been written about with great distinction uh, over the years, two of the people who've done it are people that Richard mentioned, both Tom Friedman and David Shipler, predecessors of mine, that I feel like to sort of constantly go over the bare facts is not necessarily my only job. And I feel like an important part of my job is to force readers across the spectrum to rethink their assumptions. So that if, for example, you are persuaded that uh, the problem in this conflict is that no matter what Israel does, no matter what it gives back, no matter how it acts, the existence of a Jewish state uh, is something that uh, is never going to be accepted by uh, its neighbors. Then I want to give you details and facts and narrative lines and, meet, and make you meet people that will force you to rethink or at least reconsider the certitude of that assumption. By contrast, if you're convinced that the only problem is the building of settlements, the occupation, and if those things were to change, if Israel were to get out of those lands, and there were to be a two-state solution that from then on, peace would doubtless reign in the Middle East, I also want to introduce you to people and into thoughts and narratives and details that will force you to rethink those assumptions. In other words, in a world where typically that is discussed in black and white, I want to traffic in gray. And I have found that that is a good way to get everybody to hate you. And in two years on the job, I really feel like I've been successful. <laughs> it's not just the gray that I want to talk to you about. I also want to tell you two things, and they are exact opposites of each other, and they are simultaneously true. The first thing is that I want to say to you, if you sort of imagine me standing on a windswept hill and behind me is the country I'm reporting on, to say to you, the people back here, they may look different from you, they may talk a different language, they may, many of them, be a different religion than you, than many of you, but they love their children, they uh, care deeply about providing for them, they laugh when things are funny, they like action movies, they like ice cream, in other words, they're people just like you and me. But the second thing I want to tell you is the opposite of that, which is that if you think that by understanding that they have basic human issues like liking action movies and liking ice cream and loving their children and so on, that you think that you know and understand the people behind me, you're wrong. These people are completely different from you and me. There is culture, there's ideology, there are conditions on the ground that have created a very different set of assumptions about how they lead their lives than the way you lead your lives. And I want to be able to say both of those things to you uh, at the same time. 
One of the assumptions that supporters of Israel and indeed supporters of the Palestinians tend to make about coverage is that their side gets a raw deal. That we are in the media and in the newspaper business un, un, inappropriately unkind and rough on the team that you support. But one of the things I want to tell you today is that it is to, to, to focus on problems and disputes and tensions, that's what we do. It's not about Israel, it's not about the Palestinians, it's about journalism. The correspondent in Brazil is hated by the Brazilians. The correspondent in India, the correspondent in South Africa, in Russia, in China, in all places we deal with problems. It's not something unique to Israel or to the Arab and Palestinian side of things. But of course, for Israelis, there is a feeling that it matters a great deal. Ben-Gurion, the founding prime minister of Israel, said Israel future depends on two things, its army and its international reputation. And so there is a sense that what we write is terribly important. But I'm telling you, it's not aimed at Israel. Even in the United States, we write basically about problems, even in New York. If you think about what we write about every day in New York City, we don't write about a million people going to work every day, coming home and having family, having dinner with their family and watching television. We write about the one guy who got shot in the head on his way home. And then we tell you about him. Now, in other countries, it is also true that when they write about our country, they tend to write about problems and conflicts and too. But we don't really care because we're a big, powerful country. We don't care as much what people write about us. But in Israel, and for a small group like the Palestinians, it feels terribly important. Part of the problem for me in my job is that I am dealing not just with two separate narratives, but with two competing narratives. So, for example, I have colleagues who obviously cover more than one society, more than one country, more than one story. My colleague in Rome, for example, Rachel Donadio, covers Italy, covers Greece, covers Spain and Portugal. Melding, changing stories that have occasionally contradicted one another over the centuries. But my story is black, white, black, white, black, white. Everything the Palestinians believe, the Israelis believe the opposite of, and vice versa. And it makes it an extremely challenging job to do. I'm not looking for sympathy, I'm just trying to explain it to you. One of the problems is just the choice of language, so that, for example, that holy place in Jerusalem, up on a small hill there, is it the Temple Mount, as the Jews call it, or is it the Noble Sanctuary, as the Muslims call it? It's both. Who gets top billing? Well, let's see, the Jews were there first, but there are a lot more Muslims, and they've been there a lot longer now. It's hard to know, and so we find ourselves constantly, no matter which choice we make in the course of our telegraphic writing, we get blamed for having made the wrong choice. Think about that. Uh, that thing that's snaking its way down between Israel and the West Bank along what's called the Green Line and inside in some portions quite substantially so. The Israelis call it a fence because that sounds kind of neighborly. The Palestinians call it a wall because that sounds aggressive. The New York Times calls it a barrier because we think it sounds like nothing and that's what we want to do. People want their narrative and the language and the buzzwords of their narrative to be the dominant one. I spoke to uh, Westchester in Westchester, New York, uh, Orthodox community about four or five years ago when I was the deputy foreign editor and we had come up with the term barrier as a means of finding our way between the Israeli and Palestinian narratives. And I, it, it, I spoke about why we use that term and after my talk, uh, a woman came up to me and asked me a question. In the course of my answer, I said to her, I used the word barrier. And she starts poking me in the chest and saying, fence, you're talking to a fence person now. She wanted me to talk in her language. But in fact, that's not my job. And it's very important to me that we find cool, unheated language to describe what's going on. Right now, I cannot bring you very good news from, uh, from Jerusalem in terms of the possibilities at, uh, as I see them for a peaceful negotiated end to this conflict. Uh, it's been more than a year since the Palestinians and the Israelis have sat down together. And 
It is true that we are now hearing that in late February there's going to be a so-called proximity talks in which the Americans under George Mitchell will go from the Israelis to the Palestinians and back within, in an effort to get somewhere. But it doesn't look to me like there is an enormous amount uh, of will on either side to make many sacrifices in order to get where I think it would need to go for the two sides to agree. And in fact, I would say that on some level, each side thinks that time is on its side. Each side knows it's not, but somehow deep inside it suspects maybe it is. On the Palestinian side, there is a sense that, you know, damn it, we've already agreed to give up uh, what is, what, what ex the pre-67 boundaries, and we've, ag we've agreed to accept the existence of Israel, and so now we're just waiting to get our state. And it's not just we who are waiting. The whole world agrees with us. The UN, the United States, everybody agrees that we should get the West Bank and Gaza as our state and East Jerusalem as our capital. So why should we sit down with a government that doesn't seem to want to give that to us? We'll wait. The world will pressure the Israelis. The Israelis, on the other hand, have the view that Although it began a little rough with the Obama administration, right now they've kind of figured it out with one another. First, there was this desire on the Obama administration's part to demand a total freeze of settlement building in the West Bank and, in fact, in East Jerusalem as well. That did not work. The Israelis made sure that it didn't work, and the Americans realized they weren't going to get what they needed on that score, and so they pulled back. They, in the late November, they came up with a solution or in any way an approach called a moratorium or a pause uh, in building for 10 months in the West Bank and not in East Jerusalem. And now the Americans and the Europeans are helping them, trying to get the Palestinians back to the table with the Israelis. So from an Israeli perspective, time is on their side too. They can kind of let everyone do the work of pushing the Palestinians back to the table with them. But of course, there is so much power in the hands of each side that it almost doesn't recognize on its own. The, the Palestinians think they have no power, but we know that they do to upset the process and to frighten the Israelis. And the, and, the, and the Israelis think, why can't the Palestinians do what they need to do? But of course, there's an enormous amount of power in the hands of the military, far more than in the hands of the Palestinians. And when they talk about building the economy, there are all sorts of things that, that the Israelis have not agreed to do, that, that they've agreed to do, forgive me, but they've not actually performed in terms of the economic development. So each side has this feeling of injustice and that the other side will be pushed in its, in its path. And I think, to be perfectly honest, that leaders in both sides are split down the middle themselves. I think that Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, one day wakes up and thinks, we're going to have a two-state solution, and another day wakes up and thinks, if we just hang in long enough, this, thing, this problem will go away and we'll be able to have what we need in the West Bank. And I think that's because most Israelis and most Palestinians wake up in different days in that way. Now, here, sitting here in this beautiful place and very far away from that conflict uh, and reading um, what you do about the conflict, it must seem to you that the Israeli military is in kind of a bad way right now. We have the Goldstone Report. This is the, uh, a report led by Judge Richard Goldstone, uh, a South African jurist who has uh, led a committee set up by the UN to look at what Israel did in Gaza, and in theory also what Hamas did in the Gaza war. Um, but it's not just what happened in Gaza. If you think about the last six or eight years, you think about the Lebanon war of 06, you think about the, uh, the, the, the way Israel dealt with the West Bank in 02 and 03, and you think to yourself, this must be a military in trouble. It's constantly being accused of doing terrible things. But if you sit in Israel and listen to how Israelis talk, the opposite is true. Actually, the military today is viewed as the only successful institution in Israel. It's the place that is getting things done. So that, for example, they went to war in Gaza to stop the rockets. The rockets have stopped. They went to war in Lebanon to stop Hezbollah's activities on the northern border. It's the quietest in the northern border since it's been since the 1960s. They went into the West Bank in order to stop terrorism. 
terrorism has stopped. Of course, in all cases at great cost to the people on the ground, but I'm asking you to think of yourself living in Israel and what does that mean? And what you know is it's a safe place today and it wasn't yesterday. But of course, there's a paradox here. And the paradox is the one I mentioned, which is the sense that Israel its reputation, international diplomatic standing, has been falling as a result of its military activities, particularly strong as a result of what happened in Gaza. So there is this paradox, which is that on the one hand, we've, we, the Israelis, say to themselves, have accomplished what we sought to accomplish. We feel safe. On the other hand, everybody hates us even more. So there's a school of thought in Israel that says that's because they don't want us to be safe. That's because they like to see us as victims, and therefore there is no reason to yield to all of the complaining. And then when there's an earthquake in Haiti, Further evidence of the ability of our, of our um, military is we go, send in, uh, and set up a, a hospital, a field hospital, faster than anybody else, doing it very well. Further evidence inside of Israel of the importance and strength of the military. Now, these are things that are important in understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I want to suggest to you tonight that the, this centrality of the military in Israeli society today is also important for another and in some ways far more significant thing that's going on and in the region and that is Iran okay the the moment uh, we're, we're all aware that uh, that there's great concern that Iran is in the process of building nuclear weapons that all efforts to get it to do otherwise are failing there's been further news on that just in the last 24 or 36 hours and so when you think about the Israeli view that says Diplomacy, the Oslo peace process, the efforts with Lebanon and so on have not gone well, but our military activities have succeeded, and you apply that to the Iran model, it's to tell you that this is a serious issue in Israel today, and the possibility of Israel, in fact, going, uh, deciding to use its military might to stop the Iranian development is not trivial, it is real. Whether it will happen, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it is a very serious possibility. What's happening in the Israeli military establishment, military intelligence establishment today, is that they are watching what they themselves call a series of ticking clocks in Iran and about Iran. The first one is the enrichment of uranium, what's called low enriched uranium, because that's basically what Iran has been doing. You, you, when you do low enriched uranium, you get about 4% enrichment. When you want to bomb, you need about 85 or 90% enrichment. The more low enriched uranium you have, the faster you can get to a high enriched uranium if you want to. At the moment, Iran says it doesn't want to go there. Very few people believe it. So the question is, how much LEU, how much low enriched uranium is Iran making? How fast, how many centrifuges are spinning? And the longer, if the, the, the view in Israel today is that if the Iranians were to decide today, you know, we're actually going to violate the non-proliferation treaty, we're going to throw out the international inspectors, and we're going to build a bomb based on what we have with the low enriched uranium, it would take them about a year. But if we wait another year, and they were to make that decision then, it would take them only four to six months. So that this is one ticking clock the amount of LEU that Iran is making, watching, watching this clock from the Tel Aviv Defense Ministry. The second is the ability of Iran to withstand an Israeli attack should Israel decide to act. And that depends on what, what kind of anti-missile system, uh, anti-aircraft system they can get. And of course, they've been trying to buy the S-300s from Russia for two years. It seems like Russia has decided not to do that under strong American and Israeli pressure, but there are other developments underway in Iran that also would make a difference in terms of Israel's ability to successfully carry out an attack. I just want to make clear you understand I'm not urging this attack. I'm just telling you what they're talking about. The third thing is this American-led diplomatic endeavor. So about six or 10 months ago, of course, there was the sense that the Obama administration wanted to sit down with Iran and really talk. 
the rigged and stolen elections of last June and the subsequent failure of these efforts to go anywhere have increasingly pushed the Americans to Plan B, which is a sanctions approach. And by the way, in the last six or ten months, the Europeans have been actually more hawkish on Iran, more oriented toward Israel's view that diplomacy is a waste of time than the Americans. But I would say that all have kind of lined up now, pretty strongly in a view, that the next step is sanctions. It's not universal. China doesn't want to do it. But interestingly, Russia does want to do it, or at least says it wants to do it. A third clock that's ticking is internal Iranian politics. Before this election, the, there, were, the, there were sort of intelligence people in, in Israel who'd say, well, I think if we were to bomb Iran, we would still get a lot of people behind us because they don't want this regime in power. They don't like them. Other people would say, no, but that's how you're going to unite the Iranians behind their government. And it was a big issue. Today, in the wake of the stolen election, there is a greater sense, and I can't tell you if it's accurate, of daylight between the regime and the people. Of course, that's accurate. The question is, if Israel were to attack Iran, would that actually close that gap? That would be the, there are people who believe the one way that this, the regime can survive is for Israel to attack Iran and its nuclear facilities. So that's another ticking clock. And finally, the fourth ticking clock is Israel's own ability to withstand the expected um, retaliation that will come from Hezbollah in southern uh, Lebanon, which has about 40,000 missiles uh, underground that they would doubtless pull out and shoot, and the same with uh, Hamas-owned weapons uh, in Gaza. So you have these four ticking clocks. No one knows how fast any of them are moving, and of course they would make anybody dizzy trying to watch them, but that, that's sort of the calculation that's going on right now. And then thrown into this is the whole question of Israeli-U.S. relations, which, as I say, have improved markedly in the last four months or so. But there remains this central problem of settlements. For, uh, for the American government, in fact, for every American government since 1967, the settlements are, of, are a bad thing. They used to call them illegal. The American government stopped calling them illegal during the Reagan administration, but they continue to call them a problem, a, a barrier to peace, a blocking of any chance of there being a two-state solution. And indeed, on their face, they are a problem for the development of a two-state solution. But one of the things that I have found, and I've spent a lot of time in the last months uh, with the settlers and in the settlements, writing, uh, my colleague Isabel Kirsch and I have written two parts of a series that we're continuing work on. And that is the sense that I have that the, that the settlers are just incredibly determined to do what they do. I, in my 25 or 30 years that I've been doing this kind of work as a reporter and as an editor, one of the things that I feel that I've learned is that history is made by people who don't stop, who don't give up. And the settlers are those people. They don't care about, uh, they don't care about uh, material goods. They don't care about what you think of them. All they know about is this is what they're going to do. This is how Zionism is is uh, pursued, and they are going to keep doing it. And they're keeping doing it. Even during the moratorium, they're keeping to do it. One of the stories I want to go back to next week when I go home is to look at exactly how is it going on, and are, is this government actually able to maintain the moratorium that it's committed to? There is almost an erotic attachment to the land by settlers, and it's a fascinating thing to see. Not all settlers. Of course, there are a bunch of mainstream people who live basically in suburban neighborhoods. But the leaders of the movement, the people who really are out in the hills building all the time, it's an extraordinary uh, outlook on the world. And it's something that I find not just in the settlements, but I find generally in Israel and among people, uh, Palestinians as well as Israelis, is the sense that being there in this land is on its own a kind of divine mission. People walk down the street and feel that they are fulfilling God's promise to them. And that is an unbelievably motivating factor, something that I don't think that most of us live with, that I have found uh, an amazing thing to observe over there. And one of the reasons it's going to be so hard for people to compromise because they're listening to different gods. One of the things that people who 
are angry at coverage of Israel say is, why Israel? Why are you focused on Israel all the time? Why not Sudan? Why not Congo? Why not places where people are really being killed and tortured and disemboweled? And the reason they say must be that it's anti-Semitism. You must be doing this because you don't like to see what you don't like to see the Jews succeed. There must be some anti-Semitism playing some role here, but I think there are other answers too. One of them is that this land and this brings me back to the fact that the way the Palestinians also feel about it, this land is holy to count them four billion people in the world. That's two billion Christians, two billion Muslims, and 175 Jews, okay? That's a lot of people focused on this land. Those names, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Hebron, they are not just names of cities for an awful lot of people in the world. They are part of their spiritual heritage. And so they care deeply about what goes on there much more than they care about what goes on in Congo. And I think that the, there are other elements about this story that make it so powerful journalistically as well. I mean, if you just think about the return of the Jews to this land after 2,000 years and, at, and just 60 years, or really a few years at that time, after they were nearly entirely destroyed uh, by, uh, by, the, by the Nazis in the greatest act of genocide in history. So you have a people nearly destroyed that goes back to a place that its ancestors were from and builds in a few short decades an extremely successful society. We call that a good story where I come from. So that's another reason there's a lot of focus uh, on that country. But then, of course, after 1967, and indeed before, depending on how you tell the story and think hard about it, it's not just that this victim, victimized nation goes back to a land, but in the course of reestablishing itself, it of course becomes a victimizer itself. There is an occupation. There are, there are guys with guns pushing other people around. And so that is what we call a good story where I come from, that the victim becomes the victimizer. These tropes, these narrative uh, 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 styles, these are things that are filled literature, literature from the beginning of time. And then, of course, today, in the wake of September 11th, we have the broader question of uh, whether Islamic radicalism is growing and what does that mean. And in a lot of ways, my colleague Tom Friedman likes to say that what happens in Israel is off-Broadway to Broadway, that what happens there uh, is often a place where some of these larger issues are tested out, and the role of Islamic radicalism is certainly one of them. I would also say that for people who don't, who aren't steeped in this, people who didn't grow up Jewish, uh, this Zionist narrative, it's kind of hard to grasp. It's a little bit complicated. The Palestinian narrative is pretty straightforward. You lived there for hundreds of years. Some people, mostly from Europe, who think that they were from there before come and displace you. That's not good. I've suffered, and I get that. Palestinian narrative is clear. The Zionist narrative is subtle and complex, and of course, that's why people are angry with our presentation of it, and we do the best we can. But I'm telling you, it's a much more complicated uh, narrative than the Palestinian one, and harder for outsiders to feel clear sympathy with. There's also this question of what is the Jewish people? How is it that you can convert into a people? There's no other people I know of that you can convert into. In other words, if I'm sitting in India and I decide I want to be an Israeli citizen, I can study for a year with a rabbi, get an Orthodox conversion, and instantly have citizenship in a country thousands of miles away. That's hard to grasp for people. There is something sui generis, unique, about the Jewish narrative, and it is not something that necessarily everyone has instantaneous sympathy for. All of this defensiveness that has developed in the last years, uh, particularly in the last year in Israel and on the part uh, of its supporters to the criticism is very understandable, but it has also, de it has also created a kind of def instant defensiveness in which the criticisms are often not even heard. So that the Goldstone Report is a great example, and in the Q&A we can talk about it in greater detail if you want, but there are things that are clearly problematic in the Goldstone Report. I say clearly, just from the point of view of uh, what's decent um, 
nonfiction writing. In other words, one of the things that I do is I go around and gather facts and I try to present them as clearly as I can. In the case of the Goldstone Report, they say A happened, B happened, C happened, D happened. The only conclusion you can draw from this pattern is that Israel purposely went in to terrorize, kill, and harm civilian infrastructure and, 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 uh, and civilians generally. It seems to me that if they had, that the Goldstone Committee had written A, B, C, D, one needs to know what led to this, that would have been a lot smarter. But the result is that they overstepped what you can know. You, they can't know that that's what Israel set out to do. They didn't even interview anybody in Israel because the Israelis wouldn't cooperate with them. So, and that partly was what irritated them. But, the, but part of the problem is that in these 575 pages, there are some very genuine damning issues that Israel needs to look at. And for, in the beginning, it said, you know what? The hell with them. We're not even going to look at them because they hate us and they're out to get us. And I think that's a problem. What has happened from international pressure is that Israel has started in the last few months to look more seriously at the assertions in Goldstone. And we won't know for another couple of weeks, I don't know exactly when, when the Army's report is finally published, what exactly they say about the mistreatment of prisoners, the destruction of property, and so on. Uh, but I can tell you from my weeks after the war that I spent in, the, in Gaza looking at what happened is that it looks like a bunch of bad things happened. I mean, not only bad things, there's no doubt in my mind that there were also uh, certain things, certain, there, there were humane treatment at times, it was not all horrible, but my experience showed me that there was clearly um, a fairly aggressive posture that Israel went into Gaza with. And I think there were a set of assumptions in the war that turned out not to be true that also led to suffering. The central assumption was that if Israel went in and told people to leave, and as you, if you followed this story, you know that they did. They sent out leaflets, they dropped leaflets, they made robo phone calls, they text messaged people, and they said, we're coming into your neighborhood or your village, you need to get out because we're coming in tomorrow. And the assumption in Israel was if they did that, people who didn't leave would be the bad guys. Normal people would leave, and then only the fighters would stay. But that turned out not to be true. In El Atatra, the northwest village that I spent a week trying to figure out what happened, I talked to a lot of people who didn't leave because they thought they had nowhere to go. They had known the Israelis in the past as being not so difficult to deal with. The Israelis had come and gone. They spoke Hebrew, they were on the phone with Danny in Steyrot, or Moshe in Tel Aviv, and they basically had the view that if they just hung tight where they were, it would be fine. And then suddenly, this military behemoth sweeps into their village and treated them with enormous suspicion, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So I think there were a set of assumptions on both sides that uh, caused, uh, led to a bunch of more suffering as well. One of the reasons also that there has been so much rage about what happened in Gaza uh, in that war is because the blockade imposed by Israel and Egypt both before and since has meant that rebuilding is impossible. Uh, so that you, if, you, if 4,000 homes were destroyed in this war, uh, a bunch of them not necessarily, believe me, not military targets, but in my interviews of um, uh, of um, military commanders on the ground, uh, what are called Mem Mem or Mem Pe, the, the local brigade commander and platoon commanders in Israel. When I was, I was permitted to talk to a bunch of them for this El Atatra story that I did, uh, what I found is that a bunch of houses were destroyed because, for example, if you're going to put your guys in a house, your soldiers, to hold that area for a while, the houses around it, you blow up. I'm not telling you it's good or bad, but that's what they decided to do. They didn't want snipers, they didn't want problems. So they would take over a house, then they'd go around to the houses nearby, tell people to leave, and then they would destroy the homes. But their public stance was we only blew up homes in which there were uh, actually uh, munitions or stuff that related to Hamas. And I know, I could stand here and promise you that, that wasn't true. Now, you could still say it's okay, that it's reasonable, you want to protect your own soldiers, you can make whatever judgments you want, but the facts need to come out in order for us all to make our judgments. And 
the, the difficulty in, is that now that these homes were destroyed and factories and other things, that because no one is being permitted to bring in building material today, it makes it, you have this kind of festering sore. And my sense is that if the homes had been rebuilt, there'd be less anger six months later about the war itself. For the Palestinians who live in Gaza, I would say a majority of Palestinians in Gaza are anti-Hamas, perhaps a large majority. Uh, broadly, I would say the Palestinian, the Palestinian people there are divided about 25% uh, pro-Hamas, maybe 30% pro-Fatah, and the rest non-committed. Many of them voted for Hamas in 2005 out of anger at Fatah, but they really are not very pro-Hamas today. Now, for a lot of these people, and many of them have, I say many, but there are certainly a sizable portion that have been educated abroad, that have professions, they have no economic life today. They are forced to a kind of large welfare state. There is no uh, malnutrition, there is no starvation, and there is nearly universal literacy in Gaza. Gaza is not the most miserable place on earth by a long stretch. Most of Africa is much worse off than Gaza. But it is a very unhappy place for a lot of good reasons today. And particularly so for the professionals who, who have no kind of political horizon to look forward to. They don't, the idea in Israel, the idea that uh, the Netanyahu has is to make Gaza look bad and the West Bank look good. The question is, what are the Palestinians who've come to that conclusion supposed to do about it? There doesn't seem to be any possibility of anyone rising up in Gaza. And I know that the American government would like to come up with another policy, and nobody quite knows what to do. One of the problems in my job also, in terms of uh, reporting on the two sides, is that they are not equally accessible for a reporter. Israel is incredibly open and accessible, broadly speaking, to a reporter. You know, you show up and get your government press card, you, they will hand you a list of all the phone numbers of the ministries, of all of the members of the Knesset, and within about eight minutes you can get the cell phone numbers of most people in power in Israel. So you, you have incredible access, not just that, it is a society that is yelling at each other all day long, as anyone who's been there knows. You can, if you wanted to, as a reporter in Israel, you could get up at 6 a.m. and you could turn on two radios, one to Kol Yisrael, the state radio, and the other to the army radio station, and you can just between 6 and noon, listen to basically the entire government being yelled at by a bunch of rather uh, hard-ass reporters. And by the time that, that that noon mark has passed, you could then take a nap and then write your story later for your newspaper at home. I've never done such a thing. I'm not saying I've ever done it. I'm just saying if you wanted to, you could do it. On the Palestinian side, as across the Arab world, it's very different. There is not that robust level, that spirited kind of debate. There is, it is a, a much, much more constricted public discourse, and there is no investigative journalism. There are no columnists in the newspapers saying that the government has done something wrong and calling for another way to go. And, of course, there is generally a kind of low expectation for the government's performance. So, the difference is very marked, especially for a foreign correspondent, because as a foreign correspondent, it is rare that you develop new facts on your own. You are basically there listening to a society talk to itself and creaming that conversation off and then presenting it to your readers at home. If the conversation is not robust and rich, as it is not in the Palestinian Authority or in Gaza, it's very hard to give you a kind of robust, rich discussion of what's going on. It does go on at a quieter level. There, I'm not saying that there is no dissent, but what I am saying is it's very hard to get to. And that leads to an imbalance in coverage uh, that I think we are all guilty of who, uh, who cover the, these two conflict, these uh, two societies in conflict. The truth is it's not so different for the rest of the Arab world itself. Uh, it, one, an interesting exercise for those of you thinking of taking a visit is when you were, get up in the morning in Jerusalem, you can buy the Jerusalem Post, the English language newspaper, or Arts in English. Then you can take a, a taxi down to the Allenby Bridge, 
take another taxi up to Amman, Jordan, and buy the Jordan Times, and you will find that the two papers are talking largely about the same thing, which is what's the future of Kadima in Israel? In other words, because Arab societies tend not to speak about themselves, they tend to speak about Israel, and Israel speaks about Israel. Everyone's speaking about Israel. Now, if you grew up in Saudi Arabia or in, in Jordan, in which not a single Jew lives, and all you do all day long is read about the, uh, what's going on in the Jewish state, no wonder you think the Jews run the world. <laughs> As I said in the beginning, I think the situation is quite grim right now in terms of the possibility of making progress. There's a Palestinian uh, intellectual named Sari Nuseba who uh, has, he's the president of Al-Quds University in East Jerusalem, and he's written a wonderful book, an autobiography, and in the book, he quotes his father as telling him that rubble makes the best building material. I don't really know if that's true, uh, but I would say to you that if I'm going to leave you with any sliver of hope so that you don't decide to go home and commit suicide about this conflict, it may be there somehow, that things are in such rubble, and if rubble makes the best building material, maybe we have something to work with. I can tell you that when I was a reporter in, the, in Jerusalem in the 1990s for the Boston Globe, there was very much the opposite sentiment. There was a sentiment in the air that this peace deal was somehow inevitable. And that there was going, and there was enormously high expectations that the Israelis and the Palestinians were going to come to a deal that ultimately, of course, failed at Camp David uh, in uh, 2000. But those high expectations, I think, led to the Second Intifada and to an incredible rage on both sides about the failure of the deal. And so, my parting thought of my talk is to say to you that perhaps the very, very low expectations that I and others have about this conflict uh, will allow a quiet labor to occur through the Mitchell people and the Israeli and Palestinian officials, and while we're not looking, maybe they'll come to some kind of a deal. I wouldn't bet on it, but I don't want to completely discount it either. Thank you very much. When I talk to uh, Jewish people about, look, why don't you just get off the settlements, go back to 67 borders, and everybody will be happy, and you live ha uh, peacefully ever after. They say, no way would the uh, Palestinians ever accept a Jewish state. They will continue to drive us to the sea, even if we give them their own state. In your opinion, uh, what... Uh, what would most, what was the, what is the, uh, maybe no one knows for sure, but what is the most likely scenario that would happen if the uh, 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 Israelis got out of the West Bank 100%, back to 67 borders, uh, did the right thing in Jerusalem, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> uh, 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 oh, it's a great question, I understand. All right. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, my first answer to you has to be that I'm, um, I'm really not in the policy recommendation game as a reporter. So therefore, even though broad policy recommendations of the United States and even of both governments there are for a two-state solution, and therefore it's not some controversial notion, I, I accept that a two-state solution makes the most sense. I don't want to lay down what I think ought to happen because I don't want to be married to it. But and I also don't know the answer. In other words, I think that the closer the Israelis can get to giving back what, uh, it, what is the West Bank, the likelier there is to be success in a two-state solution. Now, one of the problems is that I don't know whom you're talking to when they say it'll never happen, but one of the problems is that I'm not sure Israeli society today will survive if 500,000 people have to be moved from their homes, which is the number of Jews living beyond the green line. Again, I'm not saying so don't move them, I'm just telling you the internal turmoil that we're talking about is enormous, just enormous. The minimal number of people that Israelis who've looked at this situation say would have to move is about 70 or 80,000 people. When eight or 9,000 settlers are moved out of Gaza, it caused great turmoil and so it seems 
one of the reasons that pessimism is my good friend on this one is that I don't, I'm not sure how Israel can actually do what needs to be done. And then, of course, we get to the second problem, which is, is will, that, will it even work if they do it? So forgive me for dodging a, an answer, but that's the best that I can do. But it's, it's, it is the question, it's the right question. To what extent do you think journalism drives conflict in the sense that, you know, people watch, and when they watch something, people want to have something to watch? A terrorist, for example, wants to be watched. If there's no one watching, you know, does the tree ever fall? So that's something to think about. The second question is probably easier to answer, which is, if you look at the um, sort of exodus of Christians from Arab lands in general, in particular from uh, Palestinian lands. So for example, in, in, in Bethlehem, which used to be uh, largely Christian, there are a minority now of Christians. Uh, I think it's 20 percent, I believe. Um, and that's not the only place. If you look in, in Gaza, for example, there are very few Christians left. But in general, Christians have, have left the Middle East. And as, as you mentioned before, there are four billion people. Well, in fact, two billion of those people, a uh, billion something, the Christians um, have very little presence in the Middle East. And so I wonder if you could comment on those two. Those are great questions. <laughs> um, I think that what you say about journalism has validity. Uh, but it, to me, it's a little bit like, in other words, you're saying that by focusing on the conflict, we are perpetuating it and maybe exacerbating it. And I think that to some extent that's true. But I don't think we have much choice about it. Uh, that is, I don't think that journalism is an imposition of an outlook on humanity. I think it's a reflection of how people see the world, okay? In other words, that's how, if you think about your own sense of what happens, you look for conflict, you look for difficulties, and I don't think that you, in your own daily narrations of your life, actually focus on the smoothness of things. You focus on the bumps. And that's just the way we tell our stories to ourselves. Even, you know, if, if it's been a beautiful day all day and then there's an enormous storm, the story is the storm. The story not just that's in the newspaper, but that you tell yourselves around the dinner table. And I think that that, so while I think you've got a point, I'm not sure there's anything to be done about it. On the Christian question, uh, you know, I mean, w this is a an ongoing problem from Lebanon, from Egypt, from, uh, and from Palestine slash Israel, which is that, uh, you know, for cultural and historical reasons, the Christians have been leaving. The Christians tend to be better educated than the Muslims, and they tend to be more ambitious and have greater links to Europe and the United States and uh, to be going. I mean, to some extent, of course, there are Muslim-Christian tensions in all these places, and in Israel, it isn't much fun to be a Christian as opposed to being a Jew. So there are a lot of reasons for Christians to leave. It happens that in Israel, by the way, Christian Palestinians, who are Israeli citizens, are among the very best educated of the country, as a, almost more so than the Jews. It's a, it's a very, very ambitious group of people. Uh, you're right that their, their presence has almost gone compared to what it was uh, one or two hundred years ago, but I'm not sure that necessarily, I think if you're a Christian who cares about the Holy Land, this is an issue, and the Pope spoke about it when he was there last spring, but I don't think it diminishes the importance of the land in the minds of Christians. Recently, the Jerusalem Post published a report that a fairly senior Hamas person had said they were willing to, in fact, change their charter uh, and stop demanding the destruction of Israel, which was then later, I believe, denied. Um, do you see anything useful going on uh, in a Russian participation in this process in getting Hamas to the point where, in fact, they can be an accepted partner by all parties? You know, again, I'm going to try to avoid uh, passing too much judgment, but these are very uh, significant issues that you raise. The uh, and in particular, you know, the, uh, this Dwayk, the Speaker of the Parliament in the West Bank from Hamas, who uh, was quoted by an English Jew who was quoted in the Jerusalem Post as saying that they're interested in changing their charter, and then he, with, he uh, denied having said it. And meanwhile, whether or not he did say it, I don't think that the Hamas leadership, either in Damascus or in Gaza City, 
has ever expressed a desire to change the charter in that way. Um, obviously, if Hamas can be uh, sort of changed in terms of its radical views, then that would be very useful, because they're an important part of the Palestinian people. The, there are two paths, right? You either change them or you try to suppress them and make them a junior partner. Uh, and I think both are being pursued on some level. Is it useful for the Russians to try to get something out of the Hamas? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm okay with it, you know. It, I mean, I'm not running American or Israeli policy. I think it's an interesting thing to do. I've certainly had, in my conversation with Hamas leaders over many years, a bunch of conversations which made me feel that they were uh, less radical than their public posture, but then there are other times when I don't feel that, and I really can't tell. I think that they themselves are not sure who they are. They are, in essence, a resistance movement is how they define themselves. And I think if you, you know, if you're, if you're in essence a resistance movement, you've got to be resisting against something. And in this case, it's the existence of Israel. That doesn't mean the seeking of its destruction day to day, because they don't seem to be doing that very hard day to day, but it does mean the occupation. Now, what, how they define the occupation is also interesting, whether it's just the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, or whether it's the whole kit and caboodle. But, you know, from me, from my perspective as a journalist, I find it interesting to see Moscow try to bring them along, and it might work. Thank you. How did, is, how did Israel's relationship with uh, Obama go down the tubes? Um, his, uh, the president's two or three sentences in Cairo were deliberately ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Could have meant anything from stop the illegal settlements to go back to the green line. Why did the Israelis and many American Jews read it in the harshest possible way? His reference to the Holocaust was in passing, and it was, it was to equate suffering, not equate credibility and legitimacy. And that also uh, was read in the worst possible way, not only by the settlers, but by otherwise rational people like Marty Peretz. Um, what happened there? What's, okay. the, what's the dynamic? It's also a really great topic. Um, I'll try to treat it relatively briefly, but it's a great, great uh, question, which there will be histories written about. <clears throat> I mean, I think that from the beginning, uh, Obama created uh, mixed feelings in Israel. On the one hand, you know, it's almost impossible not to be moved by this man. Uh, and Israelis were moved by him just as Americans were. Um, the extraordinary ability to speak, his own personal story, and so on. But on the other hand, he came out of no sort of political grouping that they were familiar and close to. They worried that his past, uh, having a, a, a father who was a Muslim and having lived a little bit in Indonesia and so on, that he was going to not have the inherent love that the Bush administration and even President Clinton had for Israel. And I think that because he came in as the anti-Bush and made clear that he was less impressed with the war on terror, more interested in recalibrating America's relationship with the Muslim and Arab worlds, that all of those things meant that uh, he might do, he might end up sounding and acting like Jimmy Carter from their perspective, which means, uh, you know, shifting the, shifting the blame harder on Israel than on the other side. Uh, so there was a mixed feeling at first, and then uh, I think, uh, under the influence, uh, I've been told anyway, of Rahm Emanuel, the administration's decision early on to kind of drop this freeze of settlements in the lap of the Israeli government. They didn't warm them up. They didn't say, here's where we're going. Basically, when uh, Netanyahu showed up at the White House a year ago, less than a year ago, uh, this is what President Obama said to him, this is what we're going to do. And, and, and he was shocked by it um, because this has not been a demand before. And so that made them feel even more so that here we are. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Iran question, which is that the Israelis totally believe that diplomacy 
will be useless in stopping an Iranian nuclear weapon. And there is a belief that sanctions could have an impact. We can talk about that in another moment if you want later. But uh, the idea that you've got this guy, who, this new president, who wants to talk to the Iranians and who's demanding action from us on settlements when what they should be doing is demanding action on Iran and, and not demanding action from us, suddenly it all fell into a way. And of course, the other thing was that instead of coming you know, every six weeks to Israel to give a little love the way uh, previous presidents had, he hasn't come. So there were a lot of factors. And I, I, I also believe, and it's a difficult thing to say and a difficult thing to navigate, that there's a level of racism in, in uh, the attitude toward Obama. You feel it actually across the world. I mean, you know, we live in a society in this country in which racism is a significant problem, but it is so much less of a problem than it is in so many parts of the world where people actually think that black people are inferior in large parts of the world. And I, I hear it among Jews and Arabs in, uh, in Israel and Palestine that it's sort of a weird concept that this uh, black man is the president of the United States. So I feel some of that as well. There's something you touched on that I really want to talk about or ask you a question about, um, and that is Haiti and Israel's uh, presence in Haiti. And I feel that, um, that it, has been an ex it was an excellent opportunity for Israel to make its presence shown on a humanitarian level in Haiti, whereas the, it's a way to mask the kind of blatant humanitarian crisis happening with Palestinians and the tens of thousands of Palestinian women and children that are suffering. And there is no Israeli intervention there of the degree that there is in Haiti. So I want to ask you uh, how you feel about that. How I feel about it? Yeah, and why you think that Israel has made a presence in Haiti and not where it's really needed, you know, a couple, uh, maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles away. I'm not in the feeling business. Okay, not well, my job. I just, but I, I mean, I, I'll talk about it for yeah. a minute. Uh, I wrote a story about it. Um, and uh, the reason I wrote a story about it is because what you said is what some Israelis also said. Okay, there was commentary in the Israeli media about why are we going 8,000 miles to help people when we have suffering 45 minutes away from us. Now, other people said, you know, uh, th the people we're going to help in Haiti, they're not shooting bombs at us. So if you, wanna, want, if you want us to be nice to you, try not to shoot rockets at us. So there was a conversation about it in Israel, I'm not saying that it ended up where you would have wanted it to be, but it was certainly an issue uh, that was discussed in Israel. How I feel about it, you know, it's just sort of not what I do. How I don't go around feeling about stuff.